That's self-explanatory. Let's go to the next one. No questions. Um, this first part, this the, the first few slides um, are, I mean, they're broadly historical, but they're intended to make you understand just how important your generation is. Um, I'm gonna have to move this a little bit over. Um, I need to be able to see the whole slide. Um, can I? Okay, so Tom, Bro Tom Brokaw, who you may not remember, but he was a well-known mainstream journalist. After he was done, he wrote a book called The Greatest Generation. Um, and it profiled those who grew up in the United States during the first, the deprivation of the Great Depression, and then went on to fight in World War II. <clears throat> as well as those whose productivity within the war home front, read women, US women made a decisive material contribution to the war effort. Go ahead to the next slide. Um, again, I'm gonna have trouble. Well, I think that's okay. I don't need to see the titles all the time. Um, my generation is the generation that came of age in the 1960s. And we faced formidable challenges. After World War II, our country quickly became the biggest bully in the world, asserting a right to intervene in the political affairs of other countries in ways we would never tolerate other countries to intervene in ours. Five generations after slaves were freed, their African-American descendants living in the 1960s continued to be consigned to second-class citizenship. By 1966, the trend toward greater economic equality that had begun during the New Deal and continued briefly after World War II had come to an end. And the forward momentum of the suffragettes had also been reversed as Rosie the Riveter whoops, <laughs> as Rosie the Riveter um, was sent home to become again an obedient housewife in the aftermath of World War II. So those were the challenges that faced my generation. And as we responded to those challenges, we were not entirely without accomplishments. To this day, I'm personally most proud that the anti-Vietnam War movement in which many in which I was an activist, along with many in my generation, that we contributed substantially toward ending that terrible conflict. African Americans of my generation, helped by a small minority of whites coming committed to winning civil rights for all, brought legalized racial discrimination to an end. For a few years of us, some of us known as hippies back then, challenged Victorian sexual taboos and embraced a culture of cooperation, solidarity, and love. And most notably, <clears throat> women of my generation launched second wave feminism, which arguably has achieved my generation's most permanent accomplishments. But no historian will confuse my generation with the greatest generation. Among our many failures, these are the most notable. After helping force US withdrawal from Vietnam, our peace movement failed to secure a good neighbor foreign policy and instead permitted the US to continue to act as the world's biggest bully right up to the present day. We failed to extend the trend toward greater economic equality coming out of World War II. And instead over the past 50 years, we permitted the most rapid rise of inequality of income and wealth ever in the history of the planet. And we have now permitted our most important accomplishments in the areas of security, minority and women's rights to be undone by a resurgence of racist and misogynist rollback. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna finish this sort of historical introduction and then we'll stop and see if there's sort of questions because I know that I'm I'm painting a history and necessarily leaving out a tremendous amount of detail. 
I don't think anything could better symbolize the failure of my generation than the presidency of Donald Trump, who's exactly my age, who will go down in history, I believe, as the worst president of the United States ever, and still may become president again as the nominee of a Republican party, which he now dominates completely. Donald Trump rose from spoiled child and Vietnam War draft dodger to become a caricature of ill-gotten wealth, racism, misogyny, and American exceptionalism, which he proudly touts as his America first foreign policy. But my talk today is about something else. It's not about previous gener a previous generation that deserved the moniker of the greatest generation, nor about my own generation, which, re <coughs> which regrettably came up short. My talk is about your generation and climate change. And arguably my generation's greatest failure is that we have left your generation to respond to what I believe is the worst crisis and the greatest challenge that humanity has ever faced. Let's stop there and just see whether there's any sort of questions that people wanna raise. What I wanted to do was try and situate in generational terms um, where we are and what it is that, and the challenge that your, that your generation now faces. There's one thing I'll add about <coughs> the greatest generation in World War II. Um, <coughs> It's true that the greatest generation did participate in defeating Nazism and Japanese fascism. <clears throat> On the other hand, we should never confuse, we should never be confused about the, work, the US role in that effort. Um, the US didn't enter World War II until after we were attacked. The US left Europe to defend itself against Nazism for years. As, as Winston Churchill well knows, who tried to convince FDR to please bring the United States into World War II. We didn't do that until we were attacked. And in the European theater, there should never be, be any doubt. Yes, the Normandy invasion and the US particip participation in the Western Front in Europe was important. <clears throat> but the Nazi war machine, the back of the Nazi war machine was broken by the Soviet Union <clears throat> where most of the deaths in Europe in World War II occurred on both sides. So yes, I portray that as our greatest generation, the one that overcame the depression and participated in World War II. I didn't mean to imply that somehow the gen that the US citizens of that time period um, were responsible for everything that happened in that period. But anyway, so let's move on. We're not about uh, reviewing world history for the most part today. Ruben, uh, there is a question in chat from Riley. He asks, do you think that intergenerational conflict can be used as a tool of capitalism to destabilize solidarity between youth and elders of our society. I certainly think that's, I, I think that's very much the case. And one of the dilemmas in dealing with climate change is generational conflicts. And the simple way that an economist would put it is this, um, the interest of the present generation is to consume as much as possible. On the other hand, the interest of future generations is served by investing in environmental protection. So there are certainly conflicts of interest. And one of the dilemmas of coming up with a strategy that's both fair and efficient for how to deal with climate change is precisely overcoming intergenerational equities. We're going to see that there are serious conflicts of interest between nations in deciding who's gonna reduce their carbon, their carbon emissions. And similarly, there are serious conflicts between generations 
in terms of the interests that each have as we approach the problem. You, you might almost say that those are the two major reasons that this problem has proved so far so difficult to solve, to address, to respond to effectively. Okay, climate change, the greatest crisis ever. Climate change is different from all previous human crises. By overfilling the upper atmosphere with greenhouse gases, humans now risk triggering catastrophic changes in the Earth's climate with literally unthinkable consequences for human civilization and life on the planet. The overwhelming consensus among climate scientists, which has been confirmed once again in Glasgow, is that unless we reduce global carbon emissions by at least 80% by 2050, we may pass a climate tipping point that's beyond return. Let me, let me say one other thing in this regard. There are many problems that humanity has faced throughout our history. <clears throat> slavery, eliminating slavery, economic injustice, gender inequality. And every day that we don't solve those problems, tremendous damage is inflicted on certain groups of humans. But when we fail to solve those problems, in some sense, in a very sort of literal sense, we're in a position to give ourselves incompletes. We can tackle it farther down, we can continue to tackle it down the road. Now the victims of not, they're the ones who suffer the consequence of leaving those problems unsolved. And in some sense, it's the victims that are the ones that are giving us the incomplete, the chance to keep trying. The climate crisis isn't like that. And I, I don't particularly like to use the word mother nature, but I think in this case, it's helpful. Mother nature isn't going to give humanity an incomplete. And that, I believe, is a fundamental difference between this crisis and all the crises that we have faced in the past, overcoming slavery and, and, and the Civil War, trying to overcome ec economic inequality and gender inequality. So I just wanted to say that before going on. Okay. There's good news and bad news. The good news is that it's not yet too late. Nor does salvation require new technologies which are unknown and untested. This was the quote that Savina read, you know, before we started. It's perfectly possible for 10 billion people to live far more comfortably than most people live today on this planet, powered almost entirely by renewable energy technologies that are already at our disposal. That is, they have been invented. We know what they are. Now that's a lot of good news, but there is every reason to believe that in, our, that in order to achieve the transition that's necessary, your generation will have to overcome political obstacles as great as any generation has ever faced. So there is both the good news and the bad news. And there's a lot there to talk about. I mean, I imagine that there would be reasonable questions about the way I've characterized um, the degree to which there is still hope, um, or whether or not there's reason to believe there really isn't any hope anymore. I mean, that is one of the issues that people working on this problem and all of us face when we're trying to sort of think things through. But what I'm going to do here for a few slides now is I'm going to talk about what we, what we must do. And then I'm going to talk about the, what are considerable or formidable obstacles that lie in our path. So this is what is to be done. Here's the first problem. No country can solve the problem of climate change on its own. Reducing carbon emissions is what we economists call a global public good, which creates a perverse incentive for every country to attempt to ride for free on emission reductions by other countries. <clears throat> 
And the, to prevent this, what you might call tragedy of the commons, requires effective international cooperation. Are there questions about that? Is that something that, that, that people understand or wish to question? The simple way I would put it is, suppose China re reduced its carbon emissions to zero tomorrow, but none of the rest of the countries around the world did, did anything except business as usual. And China is the largest national emitter at this point in time. For China to do that and to do that alone would not prevent cataclysmic climate change in the least. So that's sort of the nature of the, of, of the dilemma. Another way to put it is every country would like to have global carbon emissions reduced and they would like to have some other country do it instead of them. So that basically sets the scene for what the international negotiations are about. So let's do the next slide in terms of reviewing very briefly the history of those negotiations. The international community has gathered to great fanfare to try and tackle this problem five times over the past 30 years. And it's really not even those five times because in between every one of those five meetings, international meetings, there are meetings that go on every year about various parts of the agendas that have been settled at the meetings. <clears throat> but we first met in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, and then Kyoto, Japan in 1997, in Copenhagen, Denmark in 2009, Paris, France in 2015, and now we are meeting still in Glasgow, Scotland in 2021. And everybody knows that so far, these meetings have not come close to accomplishing what needs to be accomplished. So <clears throat> here's where I'm going to present. I'm gonna first present what's needed and what would work. And then since that's not really where things have gone, I'm gonna present where are we actually here in Glasgow. So I'm gonna first present the outlines of an international treaty that is what I call needed and is perfectly possible, even while most countries continue to have capitalist economies. And then I'll go ahead and talk about what was launched in Paris instead of some sort of international agreement along those lines and what's now going on in Glasgow and what may still be possible coming out of Glasgow. I'm gonna highlight a few things from this talk that if you remember nothing else, um, these are the things you wanna remember. The economist in me says, you need to remember the three E's. A good international climate agreement should be effective, it should be equitable, and it should be efficient. And in this context, we can say exactly what those three things mean. Effective means by 2050, global greenhouse gases must be down, the emissions have to be down at least 80% below their level in 1990. Anything else, will not prevent an unacceptable risk of cataclysmic climate change. So that's what effective means. Equitable means the national responsibility for emissions reductions must be allocating, allocated according to what all of the international negotiations have called dating back to 1992, differential responsibility and differential capability. So the national responsibilities for the reductions that are necessary 
need to be allocated according to differential responsibility and capability. We'll talk a lot more about what that is. Inefficient means reduction should take place wherever they are cheapest. Let me, I mean, uh, there may be questions about these things, but I know that I'm gonna talk a little bit more about them in the next slide. So let's do the next slide and then, and then, and then stop and see if there's questions. Fortunately, we know what kind of international agreement could accomplish all this. First of all, the size and speed of global emission reductions must be chosen based on information provided by climate scientists. And they've done that. That's where we get 80% reductions by 2050 globally. It's the climate scientists that keep looking at the data, the new data, and giving us that target, telling us that's what you have to do. And they revise that. And I'll just say briefly that every single time they do a revision of how fast the reductions have to be and how soon they have to come by looking at new data about how quickly climate change is in fact already taking place. Every single time they've had to revise their estimates, they've had to tell us this problem is even more urgent than we told you last time. And that again has happened again in the past year. The distribution of national reductions must be done in accord with differential responsibility and capability. And I'm gonna talk a lot about this. As calculated by people who now have become called equity specialists, and my favorite equity specialists are those at an NGO called EcoEquity. And I'm gonna, again, if there's, just as I said, if there's, th if there's a few things to take away from this talk, the three E's, what we need, effective, the treaty, the, the, the international negotiations have to be effective, they have to be equitable and they have, and, and the reductions have to be efficient. The go-to source on international negotiations over climate change, in my opinion, for absolutely every citizen on the planet and particularly in the United States should be eco-equity in their website. It is a treasure trove of information. I think you've already read a few things off of that website about Glasgow. In my opinion, country governments should be allowed if they wish to certify emission reduction credits for sources within their territories to sell in an international carbon market. We can come back and talk about that. I'm throwing that out there because I think that actually would be an important and useful part of the most effective and efficient treaty, effective, fair and efficient treaty that one can imagine. When calculating whether or not a country has done its fair share to prevent climate change, reduction credits purchased by any entity within the country should then just be subtracted from the country's reduction responsibility under the treaty while any credits sold by any entity within the country should be added to the country's production responsibility. Now, what I'm doing here is basically explaining what an, what an effective, equitable, and efficient treaty looks like. And I'm trying to explain it in a way that makes clear that it's perfectly possible, um, but it's also, this is getting a little bit into the weeds about how certified reduction credits would work, <clears throat> what sort of market there is or isn't. And about this, there's been a tremendous amount of confusion and misinformation um, by many, many activists in the movement that are trying to do something about climate change. So I'm sure that in Q&A, there's going to be, th this is something that we can talk about. But let me explain why what I've just outlined would actually work. It is difficult to determine how many, I'm talking about certified emission reductions credits. It's difficult to determine how many credits to award any applicant for emission reductions. On the other hand, it's easy to measure annual national emissions, which must be done in any case. <clears throat> 
And here is the key. And this is the thing that many, many in the, in the climate, many, many in the, in the climate justice movement, many who are trying their best to figure out how can they participate in a way that will prevent climate change. This is the thing that I think they fail to understand. As long as national emissions are capped and compliance with national caps are enforced, any mistakes a country government may make when awarding emission reduction credits cannot undermine overall, overall global emissions reductions. And that's the only issue that need concern the international community. I can come back and talk about that. It's certainly the most technical, you know, it's the most technical part of the sort of discussion debate. And here's the, here's, here's the last point that I'd wanna make in terms of why I would, I would propose the kind of treaty that I've outlined. Partly I do that because charity and guilt are far less powerful incentives in today's world than self-interest. And because of that, negotiations over climate reparations, climate debt, technology transfers and adaptation funds, all of which have been very, very much of concern and of interest to groups that are working around preventing climate change who are concerned with fairness and equity. Because those are far less powerful incentives they will continue to yield much less than what is needed and deserved on the equity front. On the other hand, if national emissions caps are set fairly, self-interest would drive sources in developed countries to purchase certified emission reduction credits from sellers in less developed countries and thereby provide less developed countries the opportunity to achieve economic development in an environmentally sustainable way. Now, what I've just sort of argued is something that is very much in dispute amongst climate activists, particularly climate activists in the, in the sort of climate justice movement. Um, and so I certainly understand that that's something that, you know, we, we, we might want to pursue, you know, in questions and answers. But we can always come back to anything. Should we just go ahead for a while? I was just looking to see if there are questions in um, chat. I see there's one from Eli Robin and yeah, Eli, go ahead. Would you like to ask your question? Yeah, I was just wondering if you could um, explain a little bit further the, the global public good that you um, brought up earlier and as an, econ an, an economist term, economic term. Yes, it, it, it's definitely a, an economic concept. Um, and reducing greenhouse gas emissions is the, it's, it's the best real world example of a pure public good. Suppose you as an individual go out and say, I'm not going to fly, I, I am not going to get on that airplane that you know is burning fossil fuels and i'm going to reduce my carbon footprint by not flying around on vacations far away places when you do that everybody on the planet benefits just as you do you're providing a global public good you are reducing global carbon emissions. And it turns out in the case of carbon emissions and greenhouse gas and climate change, it doesn't matter, unlike most pollutants, when we emit carbon, it gets up in the, the damage that it's causing is it gets up into the upper atmosphere. It basically distributes itself evenly 
in the upper atmosphere and it contributes toward climate change, perhaps cataclysmic climate change. It doesn't matter whether that gas was emitted from an airplane that you might have had a seat in or whether it was emitted over in Beijing coming out of a power plant. So it turns out that what economists call a global public good, we have the perfect example. The damage caused has nothing to do with where the emission takes place. And anybody who reduces emissions any place is providing a global public good to everybody on the planet. But that also- Thank you for that explanation. I'm sorry for cutting you off. Thank you for that explanation. Right, okay. Um, it's also why it's such a Gordian knot to untie. Because of course the individual incentive, the best thing for me is to have other people not fly around on airplanes while I still do. And the best thing for citizens of the United States is to have China reduce its emissions, not people in the US. So there's the dilemma. That's economists have, a, I mean, sometimes economists have actually thought things through rather well. And this is one case where the thinking and the terminology is really dead on in terms of, in terms of sort of helping us understand the dilemmas we're facing, okay. Okay, so what I just did was I outlined my favorite international treaty, the one that I think is perfectly possible, um, would be the best way to go about solving the problem that in my opinion could still prevent cataclysmic climate change while most of the world's economies are still capitalist economies. We'll come back to that, I think that's important. But it turns out that's not what's happening. That something kind of like that, but not exactly is what's happening instead. And the, the, chance, to, the, the, the chance to have a treaty along the lines that I just outlined really died in Paris. And in Paris, what was launched was a different process that now we are seeing the continuation of in Glasgow. So what happened was that none of the more developed countries in Paris agreed to accept fair shares that are binding. Instead, in Paris, countries agreed to make pledges. They made voluntary pledges to reduce their national emissions by certain amounts. Now I'm gonna talk a lot about those pledges, but the first thing to note is that the Paris negotiations moved us from national emission reductions, which are binding to voluntary pledges. The second thing was it moved us from a treaty which would, which would have required contributions to be fair to one where the more developed countries are once again making voluntary pledges with regard to helping out lesser developed countries. Since it's both unfair and quite frankly impractical to expect less developed countries to pay for all the reductions in their countries which are needed if we are going to meet the necessary global reductions and because it's cheaper to make reductions in less developed countries than more developed countries for the most part. What more developed countries have also pledged to do is to make technology transfers, to contribute to a fund to help finance emission reductions. They've made pledges to do things along those lines. Now, so far the aggregate reduction pledges fall short of what's needed to meet the 1.5 degrees Celsius bar that scientists have set. And so far the pledges of financial support for LDCs are, I mean, I'm gonna say woefully inadequate. They're pathetic. And one can view Glasgow 
as an attempt to improve in both these regards, as an attempt to move along that trajectory, but to ratchet up and improve in both those regards. Now I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. I'm gonna talk about the domestic situation. I'm gonna talk about green new deals and advanced economies and here in the United States, what's been going on and what could go on. Replacing fossil fuels with renewables, transforming not only transportation, but industry and agriculture as well to be much more energy efficient and rebuilding our entire built infrastructure to conserve energy will be an immense historic undertaking. It's almost impossible to underestimate how big that transformation is gonna to have to be. Thinking in terms of more developed countries, thinking in terms of the United States. And again, I'm gonna give you some sort of little nuggets to take away from this talk. You wanna imagine what that's like? What's needed if we're gonna avoid unacceptable climate change is the greatest technological reboot in economic history. Think of it as a reboot. We need to transform what we should think of as today's fossil fuel stand economies into renew conserva stand economies. I think those labels sort of are helpful in sort of understanding the magnitude of the technological changes, the magnitude of the changes that are gonna be necessary, particularly in the more developed economies, if we're gonna actually solve this problem. We have been living in fossil fuel stand, and we need to live instead in renew conserva stand. Well, what kind of a Green New Deal would be necessary to bring this about? It's gonna require a very large green fiscal stimulus, a, a dramatic increase in government spending on projects like transforming the electric grid to integrate renewable sources, massive tax credits for renewable energy programs. That's on the fiscal side. But since private investment far outweighs public investment for a Green New Deal to be large enough to achieve the necessary transformation to move us from fossil fuel stand to renew conserva stand means the government is gonna to have to intervene in the credit system to redirect private investment away from asset bubbles and environmentally destructive luxury goods for the wealthy into renewables and energy conservation. So we're gonna need a massive green fiscal stimulus and we're gonna need massive government intervention into credit markets to redirect where it is that private investment is flowing into what kinds of projects. Fortunately, there's a precedent for this. The transformation of the US economy in response to World War II is the only precedent we need to look to. There's already a substantial literature. In other words, is this, is this, is something of this magnitude, is a transformation of the economy to producing totally different things than it was producing very, very rapidly. Is this something that there is any reason to believe is possible? Well, not only there's, we know it's possible because we did it. We did it. In, we did it from 1938 up to 1944. And there's already a substantial literature demonstrating that increasing spending on energy conservation and renewable energy production will create significantly more jobs per dollar of expenditure than spending on fossil fuel extraction in the military. And here again, I'm gonna, I wanna direct you to you know, a source that you should become familiar with and that you can trust um, when you are thinking and working on this problem. Some of the most extensive studies have been done by the Political Economy Research Institute at the University of Massachusetts under the directorship of Professor Robert Poland. And they're all available to the public on the website there. 
So if you were interested in what would a Green New Deal look like for the United States, how much would it cost? How much would it, <clears throat> how expensive is it? How fast could it happen? What are the various consequences of doing it? That is the go-to source as far as I'm concerned for information on that subject. <clears throat> now, we're talking about the United States. We've had gridlock at the national level. And the Republican Party's party is doing and will continue to do everything in its power to block a Green New Deal. If you've been watching anything about the negotiations over the infrastructure bill and the reconciliation bill, nothing could be more apparent. There is literally no Republican that is breaking ranks. Which means that the first task for your generation is to help build the resistance movement working to expand the democratic governing majority. And quite frankly, to replace right-wing Democrats like Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema who are busy sabotaging the Green New Deal with Democrats, elected Democrats who will not do that. Now this is a bit, I'm gonna go a little bit into the weeds. Um, but I think this is important because one issue is, is all hope lost um, or what reasons are there to believe that not only in terms of technologies, renewable energy, reduction in the cost of renewable energy, et cetera, but also politically, what reasons are there to believe that politically progress can be made as well? And there's some really important things that have happened at the regional and state levels, even while the national government prior to the Biden administration was incapable of making any, any political progress on this issue whatsoever. A lot is being done in blue states where Democrats control state houses and legislatures, and in particular, the blue state where you live and the blue state where I live. Climate legislation in California has dramatically reduced emissions there, including inducing car manufacturers to make their new cars far more energy efficient nationally, since they're now required to meet standards in California, which is the largest single market. But California passed the law saying, well, you can't sell a car in California that isn't a lot more energy efficient than the ones are currently. And the car manufacturers said, well, we sell so many cars in California that if we're going to do that, we might as well make our entire fleet more energy efficient. Thank you, California. The Oregon legislature passed the Clean Fuels Program in 2015. And that's going to reduce carbon emissions from the transportation sector by 10% immediately. In 2016, Governor Kate Brown signed the Clean Energy and Coal Transition Bill, which will remove coal entirely from Oregon's electricity by 2030 and double the state's renewable portfolio, portfolio standard to 50% by 2040. And when the Clean Energy and Jobs Bill, which was the basically the third bill in the trifecta of climate legislation that the Brown administration had teed up. When that bill was torpedoed by three Republican walkouts to prevent a quorum and a vote, even in a legislature where the, where the Democrats had the majority in both the House and the Senate, Governor Brown issued an executive order in 2021, early 2021, which is going to cut greenhouse state gas emissions by even more than the legislation the Republicans scuttled would have done. These are significant accomplishments. And most recently, the Inslee administration in Washington state has finally passed significant legislation now that the Democrats control both houses of the state legislature. So it's important for people to understand that there has been political progress in certain states. Um, and this is a blueprint for what can happen elsewhere. 
Okay. Developing economies must develop differently. So I, I'm, I'm done talking about the Green New Deal in more developed countries. Um, I'm done talking about the absence of progress at the national level in the United States at least, and considerable progress that has taken place in certain states nonetheless. Now I wanna to turn to less developed countries. Now, if they were able to sell emission reduction credits to developing countries, less developed, country, less developed countries would discover that even though they have more lenient emission caps due to their lesser responsibility and capability, their best route to development is not fossil fuel dependent. The whole point of the greenhouse development rights framework developed by this NGO called EcoEquity in consultation with NGOs from the global south is to prevent climate change without denying anyone the opportunity to achieve economic development by creating incentives so that the lesser developed countries will develop without depending on fossil fuels. <laughs> So let me sort of summarize some things. The problem is not that we do not know what the solution looks like. The problem is not that we must hang our hopes on invention of some miraculous new technology like carbon capture and storage or cold fusion. The problem is overcoming the political obstacles that stand in our way to launching something along the lines of the program just outlined. Let's stop here for a second and see if there's, there's any questions in chat that we should look at. Because um, now I'm sort of going to a, a different subject was, well, well, let's look very careful at the obstacles that have to be overcome. Savina, if you've sorted through, can you find some that would be worth addressing and, and talking about a little now? Sure, and I see Quinn's hand is up, Quinn. Hello. Um, <clears throat> so in our class, we've been learning a lot about capitalism and how it's caused climate change. And so I'm really interested in hearing you discuss how we could, I know we have what you've given us more specific examples, but how we could maintain capitalistic systems um, and solve the climate crisis. I'd love to hear you extrapolate on that further. Okay. Um, we're going to get to that. That's one I would postpone. There's a, I mean, certainly amongst progressives, there's a huge question about what's the relationship between climate change and system change. What's the relationship between preventing cataclysmic climate change and somehow winning and achieving economic system change? And, and I know we're going to get to that. There's some slides later, they're going to bring that up. And so I know we're going to get to that issue. But you are correct in, in hearing me say that I believe we both must, because I don't think we have an alternative, and can still prevent cataclysmic climate change even before most of the world's economies cease to be particularly neo -cap neoliberal capitalist economies or even capitalist economies. I mean, there's one possibility. I mean, it is, perfect, it, it is possible that cataclysmic climate change cannot be prevented unless we overthrow capitalist economies pretty much in every major country in the world. That's a possibility. I don't think that it happens to be true. Um, but that's very much a subject of debate on what I would call the far left, to be quite honest. So we're gonna come back to that, okay? <clears throat> 
Okay, we'll hold you to it, Robin. Um, yes. And I, I know this class in particular is hot to trot on that subject, but that's only because you've been misled by your professors. Oh, I didn't say that. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, and then I see that Jeannie Hahn, who is also a faculty member at Evergreen. Jeannie, would you like to ask your question followed by Jamie? Yeah, um, I have, I guess, one reference that I might add to what you've given us and a question. The reference is Marty Landsberg, who is a retired economist from Oregon, has written a very good two-piece article on the transition in the, in the depression to a, to a wartime economy and points out some important differences between then and now that make the, the analogy not even. Um, so my question is, can you explain how the program that you've just laid out, how or if it is really achievable without an international agreement on total disarmament and the end of the arms race, which is the major polluter as I understand it of the environment? Um, well, let me start with agreeing with you on some things. Um, I mean, the global arms industry is the single, you know, biggest, biggest emitter of greenhouse gases. So anything, anything that reduced the global arms race, you know, would be incredibly benefit. I mean, the first benefit would, of course, be that we don't all die. Um, from some sort of nuclear holocaust or war that kills even more than the wars of the recent past have killed. So that would be the immediate benefit of finally doing something to slow down the arms race and reverse it. But it would have a huge benefit on greenhouse gas emissions also. So that, that's certainly the case. Um, Marty and I are close friends. Um, I taught with him at, at Lewis and Clark, and we've been working together in Portland on various things for 14 years. And I thought his piece was excellent, including, you know, so he wrote a piece basically saying, we had a massive transformation of the US economy when we entered World War II, actually before we entered, because it started with the Lend-Lease program when we were basically sending arms to Europe, to, you know, to, to, to Churchill in England. Um, and so he looked at that, and on the one hand, you can say this is very, very impressive in the sense that massive changes in what's being produced can be achieved in a very, in a very short period of time in a very capitalist economy. And what the federal government basically did was guarantee a humongous profit rate to the barons of U.S. industry and said, you're gonna now produce tanks in Detroit instead of cars, and we're gonna make it incredibly profitable for you because we know you're a bunch of greedy capitalists and that's all you ever do. So that was the, the so he, he looked at that and in the article he said, but there are also, not, there are differences, you know, in the situation. And in some ways, those differences might make things somewhat more problematic you know, in bringing about a Green New Deal now as compared to um, transforming the economy during, the, during World War II. I mean, one thing that was, I mean, one issue is always what's the incentive? How frightened are people? So unless people are very, very frightened and become very, very committed to, we have to do something massively different from what we've been doing, it isn't gonna happen. Well, in the case of World War II, the fight was Nazism. The fight was the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. We have to do something. The environmental movement has been trying to convince humanity and US citizens that we have every reason to be just as frightened as we were. The time to answer some questions. Uh... I know you paused at this slide, but I just wanna go back and revisit it to make sure that I'm following along with you well. Um, when you, you proposed um, on your why would this work slide, um, slide 15, uh, you're talking about, I think, and this is what I'm clarifying, are you referring to the cap and trade mechanism that is already in place uh, regarding uh, carbon emissions? And are you suggesting that 
um, the solution is to have government regulation or government intervene with regulatory like incentives in order to have private um, private entities follow and actually abide by carbon emissions or um, like to hit their uh, expectations. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, there's sort of, we're going to talk at the, we're going to talk a little bit about this at the end. We're going to talk about, well, what's the essential logic of a carbon tax? What's the essential logic of um, a cap and trade program? Um, and in my view, um, there's a huge difference between what would make most sense um, for a national economy and what would make most sense for a global agreement. Um, I think for different countries, the choice of which of those policies is used domestically really should be determined by the local political conditions and what you can basically work out the best. And there's, you know, so every country is going to basically have to, they're going to have to reduce emissions considerably. And are they going to domestically use a carbon tax? Are they domestically going to have a cap and trade program? Or domestically are, going to, are they going to engage in some sort of <clears throat> regulations? And there's pros and cons of doing it different ways. In my view, it's mostly national differences in national political conditions that should determine which route any particular country should go. I don't think internationally, however, that's the case. I mean, there are still people out there, really, uh, you know, an incredibly brilliant, well-known economist who's, I think he's recently died, Martin Weitzman. And before he died, he sort of proposed a global carbon tax. And I think that wouldn't work um, for important reasons. And should there be some sort of, you know, international carbon market in which credits are bought and sold. Um, I happen to think that that could be made to work very effectively and efficiently. Um, and I think it would have had a lot of advantages, but in some sense, we're not on that path anymore. Um, Paris took us off that path and Glasgow has moved us even, or, even farther off that path. So we could talk about why I think the, 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 the why I think that carbon market and those certified emission, emission reductions credit, why it would have been a good idea, why it would have been particularly helpful, um, why it would have worked. Um, but quite honestly, I think that that's, that's water that's passed under the bridge on the international front. Do, do you feel as though it's moved, when you say, I'm just gonna clarify really quick, when you say it's moved off that path, do you mean it's moved more into a path of like further privatized carbon marketing or do you mean that it is moving into a direction away from carbon market and carbon um, taxing? I think internationally it's moved away from any sort of um, carbon marketing. Okay. Inter I think internationally we've moved away from that. I mean, it, it, Coming out of Kyoto, we had the clean development mechanism, um, which actually was a kind of an international carbon market. And that, if, if that had been further developed in the right direction, I think it would have been a very good idea, but that's not what happened. Thank you for your time. Uh, yeah, I don't, I mean, I know my answer is not fully satisfactory, but a longer one would probably not be wise at the moment. <laughs> That's perfect. I was just hoping for clarification and you gave it. So thank you. Okay. okay, we're up to obstacles. It's important to understand the fossil fuel industry has been the most powerful industry in the world for well over a hundred years now. It has dominated domestic energy policy. It's exerted great influence over foreign policy as well. A lot of the wars we've had <laughs> have been oil wars. 
And the fossil fuel industry will lose a great deal of wealth if most of the carbon it owns is left in the ground, as it must be if we are to avoid triggering irreversible climate change. So the fossil fuel industry has everything to fight for and plenty of money, political influence, and lobbying know-how to fight with. Nobody should be under any illusions of who the enemy is. I'll tell you one sort of anecdotal story. Um, <clears throat> my wife is the energy and climate advisor. Well, she was until recently, um, the energy and climate advisor to Governor Brown. And so she spent four years in Salem. And one of the first things I remember when she came home after about the first month on the job was she said, you know, it's remarkably easy to identify who the fossil fuel industry lobbyists are in the Capitol building. They're the ones with the fanciest suits and the most expensive watches on. It's like they couldn't have hung a sign on themselves, um, you know, to identify themselves. And that's the kind of just wealth, power, lobbying influence that the fossil fuel industry has built up over well over a hundred years. And we should be well aware that that's the nature of the enemy that we're fighting against. So that's the first obstacle. They have everything to lose and we should not underestimate how powerful they are. Second big obstacle, North-South political gridlock. Ever since the climate summit held in Rio, in 1992, the major obstacle to an effective international agreement has been disagreement over who should bear the burden of preventing climate change. Every international meeting has reaffirmed that one, because climate change is a global commons problem, it can only be solved if all countries cooperate. That's the thing we talked about it way back at the beginning of the talk. However, Countries bear different responsibilities for having caused the problem and have different capabilities for contributing to its solution. I'm gonna elaborate on both those things. There was long an intellectual problem as well as a political problem preventing this agreement from being put into action. The agreement that countries had differential responsibility and capability. The intellectual problem, which went unsolved for decades, was how to make differential responsibility and capability operational, i.e. how to quantify these concepts. Fortunately, climate equity experts like those at EcoEquity have now solved this intellectual problem and national fair shares of global emission reductions can now be easily calculated. Again, the climate equity calculator at that eco equity website, that is your go-to source. That climate equity, that, that calculator will tell you what the fair share reductions are for every country at this point in time. Now, 